Now, whenever we talk about object orientation, what we usually do is then say the word class. To understand object orientation, we must understand what is a class. Now, we know and understand objects. We know what objects are now in programming and obviously in the real world. We know the very definition of an object. Now, the way in which our applications work based around objects is first we need to create objects. And that's exactly what a class is. A class allows us to create objects. It's that simple. Now, a class provides a blueprint definition, which means it gives you the basic structure of the object, and then you can modify that object at a later date. And there's lots and lots to discover with the class syntax and terminologies, but we're going to keep it real simple. So let's say I'm a programmer and I'm hired by a bank, and this bank wants an application building for its customers. So the first thing we have to establish is, are we working with objects? The answer would be an emphatic yes, because we have bank accounts and bank accounts have their own identity. And on top of that, they can be owned. So another thing to look at is, can it be owned? For example, you can't own running or tall or red, but you can own a bank account. You can own a car. You can own a computer. So this again clearly defines what is and what isn't an object and whether we need to work with object orientation or not. And in our case, we do. Now, we have a customer that's going to log in to this banking application. And just like in the real world, they could have multiple bank accounts with that same bank. So this user has three bank accounts with this bank. Now, with each bank account, it needs certain information, such as the bank account type and the amount stored within the bank account, the account number, the account sort code, and also we need to be able to perform some actions on each one of those bank accounts. These are verbs or in object orientation, we say methods. They are functions stored within an object and these functions would be deposit to insert money into the bank account and withdraw to withdraw funds out of the account. Now, you may notice they all have a very similar structure. For example, they all have the nouns, which are type, amount, account number, and the sort code. And they all have the same methods, withdraw and deposit. So we know that these objects all share the same structure. However, each object in and of itself is unique. It holds different values and the values that it holds do not affect the other values in other objects. It only affects the object that we're working on. So we are isolating our nouns and verbs or encapsulating our nouns and verbs. Now, you have a customer with three bank accounts. You may have another customer that only has one bank account, and you may have another customer that has 20 bank accounts. That's a lot of bank accounts for one individual, but the point about it is, how does our application adapt to this scenario where we have one individual with one, another individual with three bank accounts, and another individual with 20 bank accounts? The answer is, our application needs to be able to generate or create objects dynamically. And this is where a class comes in. A class allows us to create an object dynamically. Whenever we call a class, it will instantiate, meaning create, an object. So this is what a class is. It's very simple. A class is a blueprint for an object. It's not the object itself. So we create a blueprint. We say, okay, we have a class and we give that class a name so we understand what object it's going to create. Well, I'm going to give this class the name of bank account because it's creating bank account objects. Now, once I've given it a name, I can start defining a few properties. And again, it's just a template. So we have the type, amount, account number, sort code, 
and we also have some methods such as deposit and withdraw. So now we have a basic template for our bank account objects. Once we have this basic blueprint, I can call upon this class however many times I need to. So depending on how many bank accounts this user has, I will call the class. So in this case, the user has three bank accounts, so that class will be invoked three times. I now have three objects with the same structure. Now it's important to note, once you've created the objects, they have their own identity. So now I can start modifying the values within these objects to match the information that's stored in my database, let's say, and it's only going to affect that object. And then I can move on to the next object and populate it with values and the next object and populate that with certain values. So each one is now unique. Now, if you were to take a look at the entire structure of, let's say, a banking application, you'd start with the bank, which that's just one single object on its own. But then you have multiple branches to do with a bank. So a branch over in this city, that city and so forth. So we need a branch class to create objects to do with each branch. And then also you have the customers and each branch can have multiple customers. So we need another class to generate objects to do with each customer. Then you have multiple bank accounts to do with that customer. So again, just like we did, we need a bank account class to create a bank account object for however many bank accounts that user has. So you can see now the importance of number one, object orientation, and number two, classes. Classes allow us to build objects.